warning. This show features dark subjects which may be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Chaos Jar. I'm J. West Secord, the loud and obnoxious one, and your announcer. Hey. Over here, our host and bag of facts, Bad Ben. Hey. And as always, joining us, our good friend, A.T. Token. Good friend in a cage. <laughs> That's where I keep all my best friends. Clink, clink. <laughs> All right. Say friends. Before we start the show. Well, they would all run away if I didn't keep them in the cage. (laughs) I said shut up! (laughs) I actually didn't. But anyway, before we start the show, rate and review, like and subscribe. You can follow us on Instagram at BA Chaos Jar or follow us on Twitter by the exact same thing, at BA Chaos Jar, or you can follow me, J. West Secord, at I'm Glad You Asked underscore, where if you ask me random questions, I will give you random answers. And you can also follow our Facebook, Pandora's Jar Podcast. We still haven't changed it. Don't argue. We're trying our best. And you can become a patron on patreon.com slash chaos jar, where you can get some cool goodies depending on how high you, you know, subscribe and shit. And, uh, you know, like early access to some of our bonus episodes. Anyway, I think that's all the cleanup. I'm doing this now. So, Thank you, uh, notebook script. That, shut up. And all that's in the, ca- all that's in the, you know, show notes at the bottom. Oh, Fine, it's in the show notes in the bottom. Of the Make show. sure to tell them, or they don't know where to look. We show. gave you work, and it's still redundant. Yes. No. <laughs> okay. Triple episode. All right. Shut up, Ben. <laughs> What's going in the jar today? Well, today we're going to talk about an actual pretty recent thing that's happened, and uh, we're going to talk about Daniel Lewis Lee and Chevy Kehoe. Oh man, I I love those guys in those movies, right? Chase. That would be Chevy Chase. Oh, and Daniel Day Lewis. I, I think. Didn't he retire? Yeah, he just he just won an Oscar for uh, Lincoln. Well, that was a couple of years ago, I guess. Yeah, I would think that would be a, that movie is a whatever. I, <laughs> sorry, that that was the last thing I remember him in. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I was in theater school. We had to go watch it for research, I guess. Did you also watch Milk with Sean Penn? No. Is that just Oscar bait? Was it a really good film? It was a very good film. Okay, I like that. However, one. it kind of portrays Milk as a. It's not entirely as accurate as it should be. I mean, because Milk was a very good man, but he also was a very terrible man. Like, like any politician. Mm, not or like person, his. Really. Not like his morals, but just he was a very hard person. He's kind of like Walt Disney that way. Ah, uh, okay, I understand. I also follow people. All right. Me. So anyway, our dumb joke aside. Continue talking about Daniel Day Lewis and Chevy Chase. You are in this. This is so, all you. It's actually uh, Daniel Lewis Lee and Chevy Kehoe. Sorry, I, I, I didn't realize it was the guy from Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, totally. Anyways, so quote: I didn't do it. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I'm not a murderer. You're killing an innocent man. End quote. This is the final statement of Daniel Lewis Lee on the morning of July 14th, 2020. After a long line of appeals, stays of executions, pleas for habeas relief, and battles over ethics of lethal injection, even COVID-19's pandemic couldn't stop this from coming when a 5-4 decision allowed the execution to happen without the victim's family, without the victim's families being able to attend. Wow. Supreme Court case, I take it? Yeah, it got really far. At 8.07 a.m. on that morning, Daniel Lewis Lee was pronounced dead. You almost said Daniel yeah. Lewis. I saw it. Uh, I saw your mouth. You've already broken him. Yep. Three minutes in. He was the first person to be executed by the federal government since the future topic of our show, Lewis Jones Jr. in 2003. And he was the fourth federal execution since the resumption of the death penalty in 1988. 
But was he actually innocent? Like he claims. I, are, are you going to tell us? Well, we're going to go through the facts and we can make a decision on our own. Oh, okay. So. I, no, just yes, end podcast. <laughs> <laughs> just was he actually innocent? Yep, we're done. All right. Good Later. night, folks. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> so. so uh, let's talk about how this all came about. So, Chevy O'Brien Kehoe was born January 29th, 1973, in Orange Park, Florida. He is the oldest of eight sons, born to his father, Kirby Kehoe, who served in the Navy during Vietnam, and his mother, Gloria Kehoe. Are they Irish, or just a big old family? I have no idea. Probably Newfies. <laughs> I, the only Kehoes I know are all Newfies. There's a lot of Newfies here in Middle Dakota. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Kirby named his oldest son after his favorite brand of car, Chevrolet, or uh. the Chevy. <laughs> when, Chevy <laughs> yeah, when Chevy was an infant, his family moved to Madison County, uh, North Carolina. Then in 1985, the family relocated to Deep Lake in Stevenson County, Washington. In 1987, Chevy entered the ninth grade at Colville Junior High School and was an honor student. Hey. So, he was a really smart guy. Hmm. This was around the time. Smart guy. Yeah, this was around the time that Chevy's family actually became very good friends with the family of a former topic of ours from episode seven, Israel Keys. Oh. So in 1988, his parents. Which one was that again? That's the one with the abduction of the woman, and he was leaving murder kits everywhere. The incredibly well prepared psychopath. Yeah. Okay. I'm pulling back. Oh, yeah, I remember the guy. Wow, that was crazy episode. I should go back and listen. <laughs> in 1988, his parents pulled both Chevy and his younger brother Shane. That's spelled with a C H E Y N E, not Shane with an S H. I don't know why they're all named like kind of like I don't know. Pardon? Like the mountains? I guess. <laughs> uh, that's Shane, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> and he would be Chevy. <laughs> Chevy Chained. Yeah. Oh my god, that sounds like an action movie star. I mean, Chevy Chain is the wrestler. Oh, wait, no, that isn't. That movie. is an actual movie. That's a drama. Yeah, I'm I'm aware. Starred Mickey Rourke. I'm uh, fuck off. <laughs> Read your story. Originally Nicolas Cage, but that went terribly. <laughs> oh, anything with, with Nicolas, Nicolas Cage, Cage would go say. terribly. <laughs> well, he pulled out of the project midway through filming to film something else, and it went terribly for him. And then Mickey Rourke had this small resurgence. So, you How know, we could can... not like be a brutal penalty for doing that. That's massive. We should all be glad when Nicolas Cage pulls out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Said his wife. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, being friends and uh, being family friends with the Keys family, uh, his family was obviously engraved in the same upbringing and that religious white supremacy, anti-government movement that they had. Mm -hmm. um, so the people of Colville actually remember Kirby, his father, as being an arrogant man who always seemed to be scheming. He also was always trying to recruit people into white supremacy and handed out a ton of racist material. Plus, he just didn't like penguins with hammers. <laughs> you, you fucking... You just broke the minute you start imagining that. <laughs> it's even better because the next thing I have written was that Kirby has a hell of a temper. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, Kirby had a hell of a temper. He once ordered che uh, Chevy to kill one of his younger brothers, and when Chevy refused, Kirby went into a rage and battered the young the young boy. How old was Stop he? Stop laughing. This is serious. Around like 14 years old or so. Yeah. Was there a reason given for that? Uh, no, it just says that there was an altercation that happened like I kill guess, your brother yeah basically. i'm mad at him and uh, then when you say no he's like now i'm mad at you <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I shouldn't laugh at that it's so absurd you have to <laughs> so anyways this brought chevy to uh run away when he was 16 Thank God. and he actually sought help from adults around him so like teachers and so on that were more engraved on what 
he says as on the grid because they're anti-government, so they're trying to live off the grid. Any relation to the like boogaloo thing we hear about? I guess a little bit. Same, um, same idea, I guess. Uh, he, the, the sequel to that that one <laughs> movie, yeah, Electric the, Boogaloo, the best title ever. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he managed to register for a social security number, which is completely forbidden by them because then you're you're associated with them. the government. Um, and he worked many odd jobs, including at a McDonald's. He even paid taxes. He moved out of his house, and started paying taxes, and so on. Feel this guy. Um, he tried many times to, start, to save his uh, younger siblings and like from his parents uh, using law enforcement and teachers and so on, but nothing ever really came of it. They just kind of let it go. Um, he eventually reconnected with his family and actually adopted their white supremacist views. Ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, god damn it! Yeah, I was rooting for the guy up to that. Uh, Kehoe married a woman named Karina Gum, and the couple had three children. He also married a second woman named Angie Seidel, sometimes known as Angie Murray. I don't know why there was two names that were listed, but there was a hell of a lot of articles going back and forth. Angie Murray sounds like an Old West name. Yeah. Like, also polygamist? Yeah, they have a polygamist, uh, okay. like, culture. Um, he married Angie, actually, in 1993. They didn't say when he married uh, Karina. But uh, the relationship with Angie dissolved after 54 days. <laughs> in 1994, the Kehoe family moved into the wilderness of the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. It's good in, things there. In the Ozarks, the Kehoe family became friends with uh, William and Nancy Mueller, who lived in the area. And William was actually a former like arms dealer. like He actually sold guns and so on. Like, he's also um, apparently an FBI informant. Is is this the plot of Ozark? Because <laughs> that that got really close there for a split second. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I find interesting is that um, William Mueller is actually uh, he actually was a former vet, just like Kirby Kehoe, and he was an amateur gun dealer, and he had strong anti-government views. Yet he was also connected to being an FBI informant. So more common than you think, because it gives them an out. Yeah. Plus the federal government, uh, most governments are tied to arms sales for a number of reasons that should be pretty obvious. All right. Yeah, very <laughs> obvious. Completely. <laughs> I. So. Yeah. On or Don't around. Do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> So on or around February 12th, 1995, while Chevy was visiting his family in the Ozarks, he and Kirby went to the Mueller house. Gloria Kehoe, his mom, says that he, uh, she told Chevy and her husband that uh, she was told that Chevy and her husband robbed the Mueller house while they were at a gun show. So nobody was home and they stole this. They stole approximately $50,000 in coins and gun, which Chevy then took back to Washington to sell. Like antique coins or something, or just like cash? What you just doing? basically cash. Oh, okay. <laughs> like coin. Yeah. I don't live in Super Mario World, so <laughs> I don't hear that too often. <laughs> no, you've never. Really? No. I, I actually. So we got Kirby this, and Mario. This is how we get canceled. This, this We're going to get sued. <laughs> this is slowly going to become the uh, Smash Bros. Cinematic Universe right here. Yep. <laughs> Oh my god, so, how dark would that be? <laughs> <laughs> and they're all serial killers. That's the true story. So later, Chevy actually talks about... Um, actually says that um, this robbery was actually concocted by both his father, Kirby, and William Mueller as an insurance scam, and it just kind of went badly. Um, they concocted a scheme where Kirby would steal the guns and other items from the house, and Mueller would report it as a fake robbery to collect for insurance. However... Um, he saw cash and decided to dig it. Yeah, it, when the police later asked Gloria Kehoe um, uh, whether the robbery was staged, she said that, quote, it crossed my mind. Apparently, the insurance claim kind of went badly, though, because the, insur the insurer refused to pay for any of the materials that were stolen. So after this, Kirby and Gloria traveled back and forth by car between Arkansas and Washington. They sold the property in Arkansas and registered the sale under a fake social security number to avoid payment and taxes and remained off the grid. So Kehoe, like Chevy Kehoe, actually um, became part of this plan 
and he kind of devised it and then his family kind of joined in and more people in the community joined in and the plan was known as the Aryan People's Republic or the ARP oh wow it's uh it's a mil- it's a militia that was supposed to bring down the US government and actually form its own country mm-hmm. And it was kind of sided up with, like, the Christian People's Empathy Group or something like that. I have a hilarious little bit of connection uh, to this in a story I was just reading. Uh, You know, I I mentioned to you guys before, I'm not sure if we said this on air, but I got my, uh, the new uh, mass comic book series. Mm -hmm. One of the characters who was a... uh, who was uh, the former partner of Kellaway from the original comic book, uh, he ends up refinding the mask in, like, 2020. Okay. And uh, he actually goes on a crazy killing spree of the group you just mentioned. ARP? Yeah. Like, it's legit. I'm like, I didn't really, I didn't know about it at the time, so, like, I was just like, oh, this makes, this is obvious, like, white supremacist group, guy's black, wants to kill them, right? Makes sense. But to hear this, I'm like, oh, now I see where they got that it's detail. Real. That was really cool, actually. Yeah. So, um, it was through this militia mo- this militia movement, the ARP, that uh, he ran into Daniel Lewis Lee in 1995. So, after the robbery of uh, Mueller. Mm. So, Daniel Lewis Lee was born January 13th, 1973 in Yukon, Oklahoma. His family, there's not a lot of details behind it, but apparently it was very neglectful and very abusive. Like, just a long line of bad things. <clears throat> Including in on July 24th, 1990, a 17-year-old Lee struck Joseph Wavra III, and then once the man had hit the ground, began kicking him repeatedly. Lee's cousin, John David Patton, helped put, uh, helped Lee put Wavra in a sewer tunnel. The two then robbed the man before Lee handed Patton a knife, which Patton used to kill him. Like, to kill the man, that, like, Wavra that they... Yeah. Was this an impulse thing or plan? No idea. Um, John Patton was given life without parole for the murder. Lee would take a plea deal for the robbery and was sentenced to five years imprisonment on December se- on December second, nineteen ninety. Must have had a flimsy case, I guess. Yeah. So then he obviously got out yeah. um, in in nineteen ninety five. He became affiliated with Chevy Kehoe, and in May of that year, he was actually convicted of carrying a concealed weapon and was given six months probation. <clears throat> so um, when Kehoe and his father actually robbed. Mueller, um, Kehoe took everything back to, uh, like all the merchandise back to, uh, Spokane, Washington, and he took it to a hotel known as Shadows Motel. Hmm. Shadows Motel plays a big part because it's where he seems to hide all his stuff. What a, uh, what a, like, ominous name. <laughs> I was, I, I was gonna say, like, way too obvious. It's like the name you give, um, like the evil bad guy's lair in some TV show or comic, the Shadow Hotel. <laughs> I wonder where they are. You guys associate shadows with bad things. It's not necessarily true across the world, though. That's fair, but like in in most cases, though, in those scenarios, you hear shadow, and you're just like, usually it's a quip to villainy and whatnot. Shadow from like uh, Street Fighter. Fair enough. I, I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> Get back in your cage. Never left. Clank, 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 clank. So, um, when he took it back there, um, by the way of the Christian identity community in Elohim City, um, Oklahoma, this is where Kehoe meets another character known as Ferran Loveless. Seriously? Love- Lovelace. Oh, okay. So, Turning into um, a film noir all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Well, In, I, I think of uh, Wild Wild West when I hear That's that. exactly what yeah. I had to do. I was like, yeah. <laughs> In June 1995, Kehoe and Ferone, Lovelace, kidnapped and robbed Malcolm and Jill Friedman, a Jewish couple. So obviously the white supremacists hate Jewish. Yeah. Who owned a store in Colville, Washington, 
at which Kiho was once employed. Kiho and Loveless robbed the Freedmans of more than $15,000. Kiho retained the majority of the money and distributed the remainder to Loveless and Kirby. Both Kiho and Loveless bought real property near Priest River, Idaho, in the respective portions of the proceeds of the kidnapping and robbery. They kidnapped a couple. And then bought property there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're your new neighbors. That, that, that feels ballsy as fuck. That's not what I would you say, but okay. <laughs> so, January 1996. So it was June 1985 that they did the kidnapping. Now in January 1996, Kehoe and Daniel Lewis Lee go back to Tilly, Arkansas to the Mueller residence. They pose as federal agents and go inside of the house. Once inside, they're in riot gear. They're in, like, a raid gear. Yeah. Nobody's home. Empty house. Like, there's stuff around, but the family's not home today. So, William Mueller and his wife Nancy and their and her eight-year-old daughter, Sarah Powell... So, she has a kid from another marriage. Um, return to the house and are overpowered by Kehoe and Lee, who are posing as federal agents, who are here on a raid because... Reasons. Guns. <laughs> God, and, I'm more wondering how awkward it was they showed up, no one was home, they're like, okay, let's fix the door yeah. and wait for them to show up. And they're just like sitting in a car going... Well, now it's what? funny because when I read this, all I could think about was like you know when serial kill what serial killers are doing when you're when they're waiting for you to return home. I wonder where they are. I hope they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I hope they're okay. I I'd feel bad if they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're uh, so caring. <laughs> so to a very sharp point. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, they incapacitate William and Nancy, and then Kehoe and Lee question Sarah Powell, the eight-year-old, regarding the location of approximately $50,000 Mueller had in his possession, plus where the guns and ammunition are. Why not the adult? Well, because the adult can fight back. So after taking Mueller's money, so Mm -hmm. coins, uh, coins, arms, uh, firearms, ammunition, all this kind of stuff, they managed to get away with about fifty thousand dollars worth of like worth of actual cash and gold, which is about eighty one thousand dollars now, and then the other stuff they can sell. So after getting all this, they then put plastic bags over all of the family member. Uh, the, sorry, they get a stun gun and stun gun all three victims. Then put plastic bags over their heads and then duct tape them shut this around their necks dead. to suffocate them. Yep. They then, uh, so Lee actually refused to kill the eight-year-old, so Chevy did it himself. Chevy and Lee then loaded the bodies into uh, Chevy's GMC pickup truck. Just like the real Chevy Chase. (laughs) This guy's a complete asshole. Yeah. Different scales. (laughs) Debate. (laughs) Real Chevy's pretty racist, too. Yeah. He's not duct taping and drowning people. As far as you know. Okay, Just well, saying. conjecture versus <laughs> provable. So, so um, We're not reading his report right now. Yeah, so they load up the bodies in the GMC pickup truck and drive it to Illinois Bayou. There, they weigh the bodies down with rocks, binding them with further duct tape, and toss each of the corpses into the swamp to basically disappear. Um, they're actually, the corpses were discovered in Russellville, Arkansas in late 19, in late June, 1996, um, in Lake Dardanil by a couple fishermen. Hmm. So they then returned to Spokane, Washington and, uh, around January 14th, 1996, they start to sell all the stolen materials. Kehoe then moved around the country a little bit to take off heat. He stayed, uh, at his parents' residence in Yak, Montana, which is a great name. (laughs) Yak, Montana. Uh, He and Shane then traveled to Arizona, then to Texas. In all the states, states, Kehoe, as well as the other members of his family, sold these guns, got rid of the property. Uh, While in Texas, Kehoe actually confessed confessed his role in the murders to Shane, telling him that he and Lee wore federal 
officer raid jackets, caps, and then ambush the Mueller and Powell. Um, and then he described the manner in which they killed the family and disposed of the corpses. Sounds like whatever partner this Chevy guy has always eventually just gives them up. Yeah. Because they're like, man, I was working with this guy, and he's a complete asshole, and I don't want to deal with it. That's also why Chevy Chase left the casting <laughs> community in season four. So. <laughs> just, had, just had to squeeze it in, huh? <laughs> worked out too well. <laughs> Did you hurt yourself with that reach? <laughs> no. <laughs> you sprained his shoulder. That was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> like, I sat here waiting for it, too. Yeah, I was like, he's gonna coming. fucking say it. <laughs> you know what's funny, though, is I only realized I was saying it, like, I didn't expect to go there, oh, but we as, did. as I started to say it, I was like, oh my god, this sounds very familiar. Oh shit. <laughs> I like that you hid it to... from yourself. Yeah, I have oh, to. we're doing it. We're doing it. <laughs> oh, man. I was like, oh shit, now I have to do it. <laughs> so, he's like an addict. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so anyways, they managed to sell all this stuff and basically wander around the country for about a little over a year. Until on February 15th, 1997, after attending a gun show in Cincinnati, Ohio, Ke uh, Chevy and Chain were stopped by police officers in Wilmington, Ohio. J. Harold Harker, which is amazing, and Deputy, uh, Deputy Sheriff Robert Gates stopped the vehicle, a blue Chevy Suburban, <laughs> for driving too slowly and errantly on the road and found license plates registered uh, a registration had expired. The brothers had also failed to produce any driver's license. Chevy, the driver, complied... And the car. Yeah. <laughs> complied with the officer's order to get out of the car, but warned him against touching... Uh, warned him against touching him, and when he tried to search him... Uh, when So, basically, he was got out of the car, but then was like, don't search me. Like, don't touch me when you're searching me. Like, he Is warned the, the police officer to not touch him when he's searching him. So the first thing we're going to do is... Yeah. So, um, the deputy noticed tr uh, the troubled state trooper was having with uh, Chevy and stopped the help. The dep uh, as one of the officers called for a tow truck to impound the vehicle, Chevy suddenly began to dash back to the vehicle with the officers in pursuit. So he's running away from the officers back to the car that's about to be towed. Yeah. The officers had pinned Chevy to a patrol car and tried to subdue him when Shane, his brother, produced a handgun and just opened fire. And it's loud, we're coming. <laughs> this allowed Chevy to jump back into the Suburban and escape. Shane himself fled into the nearby woods where police would search unsuccessfully for him for an entire day. Yeah. Sounds like they didn't put much effort, especially the way you said yeah. it. <laughs> you're, well, you're just like, they searched for him unsuccessfully for an entire day? <laughs> so the shootout uh, was actually recorded on the trooper's dashboard camera, and you could find this online. Like, it's a fucking insane thing. Like, it's insane to see. It's like 30 seconds of favor. Yeah, it actually was on, like, America's Most Intense Things or something. Like, I, for, like it's on, like, a video thing that was happening for a while, but it looks crazy. Um, your eye had a twinkle when you oh, said Oh, it was that. so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know how we were talking about Joe Exotic earlier, like, that good. Yeah. But, <laughs> although neither uh, officer was injured, a passerby was shot in the arm. Oh, so they can't aim for shit. Okay. Yeah. They're, so, they're just stormtroopers. Yeah. Most people are, cops included. Yeah. So Chevy ditched the Suburban and then escaped on foot. A search of the Suburban later revealed property belonging to the Mueller's along with federal raid jackets and caps used in the robbery and murders. They kept it that long? Yes. Ugh. Because why would you give it up? It's actual stuff that you can use in other raids, and I'm sure they pulled this stunt before. They just they probably didn't kill the other people. Don't mix and match. Don't put it all in one place. So... Both key, uh, both Chevy and Shane. Uh, <laughs> you are so considerate. So both Chevy and Shane uh, stole cars and drove west. They met up. Uh, Kirby met up with Shane in Wyoming, while Chevy met up with Gloria, his mother, in South Dakota. 
The family reunited in Utah, and in June of 1997, Shane ended up turning himself into the police. He actually just got up the one morning when they were working on, like, a ranch and stole the family's car and drove to the police station and turned himself in. He crack or something? You know, I guess so. Honestly, you can't be surprised. He already, he, we heard earlier when he confessed to all that shit. Ah, it's no. the same one. Like, he, he seems like the guy who's not gonna, to, to, he's, he, 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 he's not strong. Well, <laughs> this is his brother. This isn't Chevy, the one who committed the murder. This is That's Shane. what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, because yeah. when, uh, when Chevy committed the murder, we were talking about how, uh, Shane sort of just gave him up and what happened and whatnot. Yeah. Did I, did I mishear something? Or? I think yeah. so, because we're talking about, like, because it's funny, because, uh, Daniel Lewis Lee was the one that committed the murder with Chevy, according to court documents. Yeah. But, um, Chevy kind of just ditches him. Uh, what? Like what Lee got for that robbery was literally four thousand dollars and a pistol. Jesus! Out of fifty thousand dollars, he got fi- he got one pistol and four grand for this whole thing. Oh, okay. Does Mueller ever factor into the story again? Uh, so Mueller's dead. Oh, okay. Like Mueller, both like both him and his wife and his, Remember her daughter, the, the dead. plastic bags. Yeah. So Just curious if there's more to it or not. Every no. time I hear Mueller, I. Ferris Mueller. Mueller. Yeah, Mueller. Mueller. Yeah, Either that or the guy coming. who uh, who who tried to impeach Trump. Yeah. So anyways, um shortly after he goes after Shane goes down there, um he provided the police with paint samples from the suburban and the paint stuck and the paint like matched what was stuck onto the duct tape that was used in the Mueller murder. So that places this suburban at the crime, which whoever was driving at that time is part of this crime, obviously. And it belongs to Chevy, so it puts all of this together. Um, shortly thereafter, Kirby was arrested on gun violations, uh, but was released pending trial. <laughs> Gloria was contacted by ATF agents in Spokane, stating that she had begun to fear for her life because she knew too much. So I'm afraid my son's going to come and kill so me. So she reached out to them? Yeah. Okay. She provided information that led to the discovery of more of Mueller's property in storage units near the, uh, like rented by the Kehos, um, including numerous weapons and key fitting handcuffs that Mueller was wearing at the time of his death. So they found a key that would match that handcuff. Yeah. Um, Gloria also told officers that both Kiho and Lee had confessed their roles in the murder, the Mueller murders, a month after it happened. So. He didn't just confess to his brother, Shane. He confessed to his mom that we killed these people. So, Kehoe, Lee, and uh, Kirby were among APR members that were indicted on December 12, 1987. Obviously, um, Shane is already in custody for his attempted murder of the officers in the shootout. APR. Yeah. And uh, then they turn in uh, Ferran Lovelace for that kidnapping thing. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he had something to do with this as well. Um, Shane Kehoe was sentenced to 24 months, uh, sorry, 24 years for weapon violations and attempted murder in the Ohio shootout. I feel like 24 months would have been, been a uh, fucking great deal. Yeah, I. Yeah. Um, Kirby pled guilty to conspiring to violate RICO, which is a type of like uh, not using religious rights or something like that. Not Rico, the anti-gang. Well, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's it's a, a anti-religious enterprises for profit and stuff like that. Okay, same idea, just yeah. Okay. And he completely cooperated with the authorities, like just gave, gave everything. him everything. Fair enough. Um, on February twentieth, nineteen ninety eight, Chevy Kehoe pled guilty in the Ohio State Court to felonious assault, attempt, and attempted murder, and carrying a concealed weapon related to the February fifteenth, nineteen ninety seven shootout. Um, this also gave them, like, the ability to search the truck even further okay. kind of thing. Um, in 1989, Kehoe was then convicted in a federal court on Jan- uh, for the January 1996 murders of Mueller, like, both Mueller's and Powell, the daughter. Um, he received three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Kehoe's mother, Gloria, and his younger brother, Shane, served as prosecution witnesses, so they testified against him at the trial. They had both kept everything secret until he got caught, so they had managed to capture him. 
Fran Loveless, um, the one that did this whole thing, he was sentenced to death. Mm. Mm. So I don't know what he, what kind of connection he had with his murder. It's never said in here. And even when they talk about the story, it's just Chevy and Daniel Lewis Lee that get this the most. But I don't know if the death penalty comes from the like the kidnapping. But I've never seen kidnapping be a death penalty offense kind of thing. Mm. Maybe there's more to Loveless's side of the story. Yeah. Or he pissed someone off. Um, well, there is like a little bit of evidence in this too that perhaps he was the one that joined Chevy on this thing, but we'll talk about it in a second. Either that or he built a giant mechanical spider. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> Will Smith had to stop him. Yeah. <laughs> Will Smith and uh, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the other one. The other one. <laughs> All right. As if he's not an actor in his own right. I, I forgot his name. I get him mixed up with uh, another actor. Uh, so, <laughs> when Kehoe is... What the fuck? Eh? All right. Oh, did your computer flop around again? Yeah, it just threw me off. Anyways. Um, when Kehoe was sentenced to life imprisonment, local, local prosecutors planned to pursue a similar sentence for Daniel Lee Lewis... Uh, sorry, Lewis Lee... <laughs> but the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Are you argued... just here to fuck up this record? Is that your only job today? <laughs> I just... I'll... I can't Fucking useless. Poor Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> I think he's doing fine. <laughs> yeah, he won an Oscar. <laughs> Before they sentenced him to death. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> you gonna be okay? <laughs> yeah. Are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Anyways, no professional. So they wanted to pursue a life imprisonment for him as well. But they were directed by the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. to push for a death penalty. So, Chevy is considered the ringleader of all this, and it's yeah. openly stated. And they actually describe a, a lot, in a lot of documents, that Lee is literally just, and this is an exact quote that's in, like, so many of them, a ring, um, a uh, loyal dog. That's literally how they describe him. He's just along for the ride. Mm. Yeah, but so gleefully do, or as a pawn? Well, he'll do whatever Chevy asks him to do. So and he, pawn. like, the fact that he took $4,000 and a pistol as payment out of a 50 grand. Yeah. Like, that's nuts. It is not an equivalent relationship by any stretch. Yeah. So the U.S. attorney, Paula Casey, requested the U.S. Um, the U.S. attorney general to withdraw the capital punishment, but was told by Deputy U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder to continue seeking the death penalty. So they're just pushing for this on this guy. Um, Lee what territories are we in right now? Uh, this is in uh, Washington. This is actually a federal case now. Oh, okay. So we're in Washington. Yeah. yeah okay. So um, Lee received the death penalty on all three counts of the murder in aid with racketeering. So they Holy used that as an shit. aggravating circumstance, that it was a racketeering robbery. And then they just branched out and nailed him on everything. Um, the mother of Nancy Mueller, so the wife, Erlene Branch Peterson, pleaded for clemency to spare Lee's life and stated, quote, I can't see how executing Daniel Lee will honor my daughter in any way. In fact, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of dirties her name because she wouldn't have wanted it anyways. End quote. This was like an odd response, but okay. Some people. Some, don't yeah, I, I get it. I get it. If you, if you were that nice, I actually don't more. believe in the death penalty. Um, maybe it'd be different if I witnessed the person it, killing. It really is because I didn't either, and I've clearly gone the other side of that. <laughs> yeah, but I find they fuck it up way too much. Oh yeah, in terms of procedural execution, I'm totally with you. That's a complete yeah. nightmare, and that should really stop. So um, there was an interesting piece of evidence that Lee put forward 
A strand of hair was found inside one of the FBI caps. Um, they had linked the other cap to Chevy. But in this other one, the FBI cap had a strand of hair and he kept requesting, like his attorneys kept requesting for the strand of hair to be tested during and after, like dur- uh, before and during the trial. But it never was. Like it never was during the trial. In fact, it took so long to test it that by the time it finally was, it was 2007. Was it used as a key piece of evidence? No. No. Oh. So it came back, uh, when they tested it in 2007, it actually came back as not belonging to Lee, which dissolves uh. his physical presence in this crime. However, at a 2008 appeal over this evidence, the court rejected the new evidence and... Uh, that's political. They found that it was not prejudice to his uh, to the forensic testimony, which is completely bullshit. It is completely prejudice to the forensic testimony. So his execution was very much just a spectacle for the government and for law enforcement. Because um, it's their first yeah, death penalty first case in how long? So they have to make it stick. Yeah. What a um, shit show. So, he, like, literally the victim, like, all of the victim's family members are coming out in, like, droves and begging to spare him. Like, they're writing the governor, but the governor can't do anything about it. It's a federal crime. Now. So... Who do you appeal to on a federal level? You have to just keep applying to the Supreme Court. There's no state. Oh, uh, okay. Just... Um, so, Kehoe had alleged that his father and Mueller... Oh, sorry, I already spoke about that with the um, insurance scam, but that was part of what he used in his court proceedings to... Uh, and as part of his appeals that this insurance scam was there. So the insurance scam was always there. So there was no reason to actually harm the Mueller's, which I think is bullshit because if the Mueller's didn't have, didn't get the payout that they were going for, and they're still talking about this, well, now they can finger you. So you get to go back, get more money and then you just take them out. Like, yeah. So he had a bunch of appeals, mostly critiquing the testimony that his mother and brother made. Uh, he kept saying that it wasn't that it should have been there. Um, lack of proper counsel, so the incompetency of his counsel apparently. It's a common which, one. Yeah, that's for every the most. Death literally, when you have no leg to stand on, you still do that. Even if your lawyer was the most brilliant lawyer there was, yeah, you just run with that to try. Um, or and you a few could other it. <laughs> and a few other technicalities around the enterprise of ARP, so the RICO law. He tried stating that this had nothing to do with the ARP. So he's going after technicalities at this yeah. point. Okay. He knows he's fucked. Yeah. However, he has life in prison without parole. You get to live. Like. And conceivably, if they retry him, they could retry him for death. Yeah. If they decide to throw his sentence out, they if they decide to be like, fine. We'll just do this one instead. Yeah. You get it. They can state, like, you can get a new trial or they can state you get a new sentencing. But, um, so they never got anywhere and his sentence was just affirmed every single time. So they basically told him, go fuck yourself, you're done. Um, so an interesting note on Kehoe was that Kehoe was accused by his brother Shane and that Spokane, um, motel manager from Shadows Motel Motel. of being involved or having (laughs) knowledge of the Oklahoma City bombing. What? What? Which happened on April 19th, 1985. It was done by timothy mcveigh yeah um so th- we'll probably touch on that at some point but um sheen claims that he had knowledge uh, that he had knowledge of chevy's involvement in the bombing shortly after he was sentenced for his role in the shootout the manager of the shadows motel in spoken claimed that chevy and convicted bomber timothy mcveigh were at the hotel for four to six months prior to the bombing. The manager also claimed that on the morning of the bombing, Chevy showed up at the motel and asked him to put on CNN and became ecstatic when the news of the bombing appeared. The manager also claimed that Chevy had told him in the days prior that something big would happen on April 19th. Is going to get paid or something? Chevy <laughs> denies these allegations and the FBI found no evidence that McVeigh was ever in Washington. Yeah. Okay. This is some weird attention-seeking bullshit. I just love that his brother and this motel manager put it forth. I just see this motel manager being like, yeah, that guy. And then he's like talking about like this terrible thing. And they're like, oh, that's it? That's all he did? Well, he's also involved with the bombing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 
I am just... I actually forgot what I was going to say. Uh, oh, you can, you can I, what, stop I, talking. what what I was going to say <laughs> was that um, what I at first I was just about to like, wow, do these like, do these insane murderers have like a fucking group so, like community? Because he he was ta- we're talking about episode sevens, dude. So it's, earlier, so it's actually really really weird because like this has that tie together, and the ARP are actually like. That whole area, like Spokane, Washington, and northern Idaho, uh, eh, Idaho, Idaho, <laughs> Idaho, 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 <laughs> the northern, northern Idaho, but northern Idaho, they have a lot of like um, these white supremacist groups and anti-government feels. There's a lot of like weapon trades up there. Like um, I don't know if you know about Ruby Ridge. Mm. Uh, Actually, that does kind of sound familiar, which is rare, because I usually know nothing. So it was perpetrated after the Waco siege happened, and it was this family that basically locked themselves in this thing and had a standoff with police and the FBI. And eventually there was a death that was eventually deemed wrongful, and there's a whole thing behind it. We can talk about it at some point. Isn't that what, um, loosely what Red State is based on? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, And uh, they actually, like... Timothy McVeigh actually watched Ruby Ridge go down and the Waco siege go down and was completely behind this. And that's why he went down to Oklahoma City and they had a whole other plan to bomb a different building, but then decided to go with this building. Is this whole thing. Like, but they're all very closely related. So I like when I first read that he was accused of being involved, I'm like, I could see that, but as far as I knew, McVeigh had never made his way up to Washington like that. So I was like I don't know if this manager talking about four to six months, but then when I later read that the FBI found nothing in this and even Kehoe himself was like, I had nothing to do with that. I was like, you're just making shit up. Like, yeah. Yeah. And part of that might be that the brother is trying to like feed more information in so that he can get lesser time. Because if you give information, help him right, cooperate, right. you can get less time. And he's already serving 24 years. He could use all the time in the world to get, and also, you get to get out early if you give good behavior. So, good behavior is cooperating with authorities. Go for parole in yeah. 10 years, basically. Yeah. So, your 24-year sentence could be you're only locked up for 10, 12 years, and then you get to go home. Or you do what they did in you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. You just bet on how much time you have left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have gambling rings. Oh, you take. Uh, you have to take uh, five years now. You tend to gamble other things in prison. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> I actually think that'd be great. Is if you're in prison and you go, you know what? Let's bet. And uh, hey, guards, up! Uh, if I win, he takes five years of my sentence. <laughs> I, you know what? That almost sounds like um, like a premise for an anime. Yeah. That would work if everyone in prison agreed they should be in prison. Yes. <laughs> the other thing, though, is it would work even if they don't agree they should be in prison because if you know that your case is basically fucked, well, I can get out of here early. However, then you got, like, really dangerous criminals hitting the street because they're really good at gambling, too, or gonna, something that, like that. And how do you treat lifers? Yeah. Just infinite ante? <laughs> Life in prison. It's just like, I remember hearing about all these sentences of like 304 years, and then I'm always like, so they just, like, you die and they just keep your body there? Like, (laughs) (laughs) just uh, once a year, someone kicks it. (laughs) I I, I like the idea that it's not even like moved, it's just they're in the the little uh, recess area, and it's just like no one, no one bothered to fucking move them. Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, though, that sounds like a pretty cool premise. I kind of like that. Like, yeah. someone gets falsely accused, goes, but they uh, eventually they go into prison, and now they have to like, <clears throat> in order to get out, they have to try and bet and everything. But there's here's also the thing the, too. How would you bet the death penalty? Well, that's the thing. Uh, Holding a knife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would uh, probably it'd probably be an instant death if you're on the day of your death penalty. You can gamble someone on that day only, but if they, uh, and you can pick anyone, if that person loses, they're killed instead. Who would take that gamble, though? No, the idea is that the person <laughs> who is on death row can choose anyone 
and the other person has to so, accept. We can do this in the overflow afterwards. But, <laughs> yeah. um, I did <laughs> crazy <laughs> killing people system. Uh, I do like what well, we'll talk about in the overflow. It, mm-hmm. I have the whole thing about that. That what is more terrifying, knowing when you're going to die or when not knowing when you're going to die. Like, I get anyways, that. we'll uh, <laughs> we'll wrap it up there. Oh, uh, is anyways the main story over? That's main story. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> well. Somebody Everybody, wants to talk. <laughs> um, so remember to rate and review, like and subscribe, Instagram at BA Chaos Jar, which is also our Twitter at BA Chaos Jar. And you can reach me at I'm glad you asked underscore. You can also follow our Facebook Pandora Jar podcast. It will be changed eventually. Shut up. And lastly, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash chaos jar which yet again is in the show notes. Have a good night, folks.